Now, last week, BlackRock became one of the world's biggest infrastructure investors after it also announced an agreement to buy global infrastructure partners for about $12.5 billion. I'm very pleased to be joined by BlackRock's vice chair, Philip Hildebrand. Philip, thank you so much for joining us. There's so much going on in the space of central banks. It's pretty incredible, actually, that the world has been so resilient despite the huge monetary adjustment, unwinding 15 years of you know, monetary loosening. Are you optimistic about 2024? Well, I think that you're right. The past has been really the last year has been a story of uh, pandemic savings that have been run down by consumers, so very strong consumption. And then we should not forget government spending has increased dramatically, particularly in the U.S. And so you've seen this, uh, these two forces that have kind of uh, been a countervailing force to the contraction that we've seen uh, in capital markets through tighter interest rates. Uh, probably most people have been surprised. The question now is how much longer can this go? How much longer can you have government spending the way we've seen it? How much longer can you run down these pandemic savings? And that's going to be the story, I think, of this year. And in a sense, it's the final normalization of the post-pandemic adjustment. So what does that mean you're watching out for this year? Again, we, you know, we started last year thinking that we could see a huge recession in the U.S. We were worried about corporate default, and we haven't seen any of that. That's right. I think the story in the next few months is going to be goods inflation is going to continue to drop quite uh, rapidly. We have now negative numbers and, and that you know basically brings down the overall inflation numbers quite dramatically and as a result the markets have now priced in what I think is probably excessive interest rate cuts in the US uh, but that's going to run out at some point this is the final leg of the post pandemic adjustment so by by year end I would say we're going to be done with that and then goods inflation is no longer going to drop uh, service inflation wage inflation is still very high and so I think the story is going to be, you know, at some point we're going to realize that it's not that easy to kind of stabilize the 2% inflation target that central banks are looking for. And so some of the, uh, the optimism in rates right now in the U.S. in particular is probably overdone. But so what worst case scenario, we don't have as many cuts as are being priced in. And also that would be during a slowing down of the economy or are you, are you seeing the jobs market to be pretty much resilient? I think the uh, wages services looks resilient at the moment. A good Goods inflation is going to continue to come down. There is going to be weakness in the economy. There's no question about that. Uh, but I think what central banks will find, particularly in the U.S., that they won't have as much room to cut as is currently uh, priced in. I mean, we're sort of priced for perfection right now. And, uh, you know, there's going to be some readjustment to that. Less so in Europe. I think in Europe the story is, in a sense, clearer. Uh, than it is in the U.S. Uh, Philip, infrastructure, so what's the thinking behind that? Well, you know, look, first of all, I think Larry always says culture matters most. So uh, this brings together, I think, two firms, two partners, two leaders uh, that have known each other for four decades and a cultural fit. Infrastructure, we believe, is the big story in private markets in the next 10, 20 years. These are long-term trends. We know that we need to uh, upgrade infrastructure across the world. It also is a perfect fit. We have very little overlap in our existing infrastructure business and the GIP business. And then finally, I think the transition as one of the infrastructure stories is also an interesting piece here where, you know, again, there is a lot of synergy between what we have done and what the GIP has done in the past. And it brings us to, to scale at infrastructure. We're now going to be one of the big infrastructure players worldwide. So it's very, very exciting. So where, where do you see the, the most opportunities, I guess, for business or business deals? Is it going to be where there's growth? And is that the U.S. market compared, for example, to the Asian market? Or do you also see uh, potential opportunities in Europe? I think the global infrastructure story, and it really is a global story for many reasons, right? We have outdated infrastructure in, think of the UK, think of the US, massive need for infrastructure spending. We have the entire transition story, the energy transition story. You'll hear more about that later on today, I'm sure. That's going to require trillions of investments. And we have stretched governments. I think this is one of the key stories that also underpins this transaction that Larry and Bio announced last week, that you have... Uh, very much stretched government. So public-private partnerships, uh, particularly in these vast infrastructure projects, are going to be a very big story. And uh, this is something where we want to be part of it. Um, and so I think that's a great opportunity both in Europe and in the U.S. as well as in Asia, frankly. But, uh, so away from infrastructure, maybe a little bit, is there something that you worry that's not being priced in correctly in the markets? Well, at the moment, I think, if anything, I'm a little worried that uh, we're sort of priced for near perfection, uh, yeah. a sort of almost perfect soft landing where inflation, you know, is gone as a problem, uh, where maybe central banks could even cut in, in the face of any kind of potential weakness. Uh, 
I'm certain that w what we're going to find is that this inflation has become stickier than we think uh, or than the market thinks right now for various reasons. We have lower growth. We have very high government spending. Uh, we have a fractured, you know, geopolitical system. So all this basically raises cost. And what we're going to find as inflation drops now, mostly driven by goods prices, uh, by the end of the year, we're going to realize that it, it doesn't settle easily at 2 percent, let alone at something less so that you cut rates. But I think, you know, more likely we're going to settle uh, probably slightly above 2 percent, which means central banks are going to have to stay on alert. So do you worry about the cost of money, actually the cost of credits? And this could be because of what we've seen in the last 18 months, but actually it could be also much more structural reasons. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I think one of the stories of the last decade really is a lot of investments have been done by way of financial engineering mm -hmm. and in some ways we're going to have to get back this is another reason why we prefer infrastructure over private equity uh, we're going to have to get back to kind of macro long-term macro trends mm -hmm. um, and and realize that financial engineering when interest rates are higher than they have been mm -hmm. for decades when growth is lower, when government spending is going to be constrained, financial engineering driven investments are going to be are going to be much, much harder to find. And so I think in some ways it's a healthy correction towards, in a sense, kind of returning to investing really on, on fundamentals uh, as opposed to a lot of uh, leveraged debt and, and financial engineering. When you look at some of the concern across the globe, how, how difficult actually could it be for, for Switzerland kind of, you know, get, getting out of all the, the bank debacle, but also attracting global investment? I think we have a current account surplus, so there's no, there's no issue of capital coming in. Uh, you know, in a sense, the banking story is an adjustment. It's a tragedy, should have never happened, uh, but it is what it is. And I think the key now, the focus in politics will be how do you make sure that you have a bank that is this large relative to the country's economic and financial capability? How do you manage it from a risk management perspective in a sense that you don't ever have to get back to a kind of uh, situation that we had with Credit Suisse? So that will be the focal point, I think, of any regulatory reform. So when you talk about risks, I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible to think, you know, of what's happening in the Middle East and the fact that the market has barely taken notice. Maybe there's a bit of move on, on the oil price, but there's attacks, there are drones, there's Houthis, there's Yemen, there's Ukraine. We also don't know who becomes the next president of the United States. Like, how do you deal with all of these unknowns? It's hard. I think the, the, the overall story is that we've moved towards a much more fragmented a geopolitical system, therefore a much more fragmented global economy that is organized in a sense in blocks. You know, that means a loss of efficiency, that means higher cost, and probably means on, on balance a lower potential growth rate for the global economy. Um, now, you know, the, the focus has to be on, on maintaining the conflicts and uh, where possible to try to solve them or, or stabilize them. Uh, in a sense, the good news is that a lot of these things are man-made. Uh, you know, demographics, there's not much we can do about it. That lowers potential growth. Fragmentation, in a sense, we can address. Uh, we could find a way to stabilize the situation in the Middle East. We could find a way to ultimately move towards some sort of ceasefire discussion in, in Ukraine. Um, and we can, uh, you know, we could stabilize relations between the U.S. and China. So a, a lot of this, in a sense, has been man-made in recent years. It's a problem. It weighs on markets. It weighs on the global economy. And hopefully discussions like this can be a contribution towards lessening these tensions and, and moving back towards something that is a little less fragmented than what we currently have. Is that likely? Well, it's, um, you know, that's, uh, I suppose at some level, the simple answer would be not really when you look at, at the current state of play. On the other hand, the cost of this fragmented system over time, I think, is going to drive political leaders and political system towards trying to address those things that we can address. Some things we can't. Demographics, there's not much we can do about it. We can hope that perhaps productivity can be boosted, whether it's through AI or other means to make up for some of it, but there's not much we can do about it. On the fragmented state of the global economy, in principle, these are things that can be addressed uh, through good policy making. What does a second term President Trump mean for the world economy? Well, this is a, uh, you know, Christine Lagarde talked about it the other day. I, I think you're going to see her later on today. Um, certainly from a European perspective, from a kind of globalist Atlanticist perspective, it's of course uh, a great concern. 
you know, we've been there before, we survived it, so we'll see what it means. I think the question overall will be, does it lead to even more fragmentation in the global economy? And, you know, if that's the case, the cost of that will become quite apparent. Who are, are you most worried about? I mean, is it the U.S. economy because of a division, or, it's, or is it how Europe would, would deal with the President Trump? I, I think that the overall European, the big story in Europe is how does Europe find a sort of a, you know, President Macron has referred to this as European sovereignty. How do we find our own place uh, in this system with less dependency on the U.S., less dependency uh, on China in the space of digitalization, in the space of finance, frankly, and in the space of security. And security, of course, is the one place where the dependency, in a sense, is most pronounced. So I think Europe has a, if it wants to be an independent power, in a sense, uh, it has decades of very hard work ahead of itself to find this, this sovereign space, in a sense, in this, uh, in this uh, fragmented world. Philip, thank you so much for joining us today. Philip Hildebrand, the vice chair at BlackRock.